so that we might have life through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent us his Son as expiation for our sins. The example of love given to us by Jesus Christ in the sacrifice of the cross on Calvary is made manifest in the bread and wine that become the body and blood of the same Christ in the Eucharist. God has given us many gifts, the gift of love, the gift of faith, the gift of salvation, and the gift of the Eucharist. Gifts are things that normally we appreciate and treasure. The same is true of the gift of the Eucharist, the living memorial of Christ in our midst, which therefore we treasure, and as a gift from God we revere with an attitude of respect, love, and awe. In a few months' time, New Zealand will host the Rugby World Cup. You might be tempted to ask what rugby might have to do with the Eucharist, and to wonder if the World Cup has to be part of everything that is going on at this moment in this country. Yet, as I hope to point out, sport, including the Rugby World Cup, can provide us with analogies that are very helpful in understanding something about the theme at hand, the Eucharist, the liturgy and the life of the church. As an American, I grew up with baseball, and I thought it interesting how in some ways, as an institution, it mirrors some important aspects of our experience of the church. The same can be true of rugby, a first point. With regard to the sport itself, the game is played according to a set of rules that have seen adaptations over the years, but that have an essential core which identifies rugby as rugby. The same rules apply in the 20 countries from the six continents that will play in the World Cup. If there were different rules in England or in South Africa or in Australia or in New Zealand, it would not be possible to play test matches. The same is true of other sports. It is possible to organize a World Cup of soccer or of cricket because each sport is played by the same rules wherever it is played in the world. The players and the coaches do not own the game. Rather, they play it according to how it is organized and regulated. The players are not free to make things up as they go along. Imagine if in one match a knock-on was acceptable and another one a forward pass is permitted and another a try can be scored by simply crossing the line and not touching the ball down on the ground. Imagine if every time you came to play the rules were different. There would be, there would be chaos. The players, therefore, respect the game, and they respect it as it is. The celebration of the liturgy is much the same. There is a set of rules, which are called rubrics, that have seen adaptations and modifications over the centuries, but that have an essential core that identifies the Mass as the Mass. The same rubrics of the Latin or the Roman rite apply in all the countries and on all the continents of the world. These make it possible for us to recognize the liturgy for what it is and to participate in it wherever it may be celebrated. We who take part in the liturgy, we do not own it. Therefore, we are not free to make things up as we go along. The conciliar decree, the one I mentioned about the liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, affirmed the same principle in its general norms and the norms that it proposed for liturgical reform, because we therefore respect it. Our respect is shown in a variety of ways, the first of which is respect for the sacred space itself, the church or chapel in which the liturgy is celebrated. In the traditions of both East and West, the sacred space is that place, par excellence, where the divine and the human meet. I am a native of the New York City area. Each year when I go on home leave to visit my family, <coughs> excuse me, I usually take at least one day, if not more, to go into Manhattan from my sister's house by train, just to walk around and see what's new. New York has all these tall buildings, so I go and look and see if there's anyone new that I need, new ones that I need to see. 
I will stop in to make a visit in St. Patrick's Cathedral, where I was ordained as an archbishop. One cannot fail to notice the contrasting effect of having spent a few hours surrounded by the hustle and bustle and the noise of the city, which I do enjoy, and then of entering the oasis of peace and silence inside the cathedral. That is what all our chapels and churches are, oases of peace and silence where we meet our loving Lord. Another expression of respect is the dignified manner in which we participate in the liturgy and that we treat the objects that are used in its celebration. As a member of the diplomatic corps, I am frequently invited to very formal functions, National Day receptions, celebrations of Waitangi Day, and most recently Anzac Day, dinners offered by public authorities such as the Governor General or other ambassadors, and for these occasions the guests take a considerable amount of time getting dressed and getting ready for the event. Indeed, some of these events can be something of a fashion show. When we take part in the Mass, we are invited by a loving God to join in the eternal banquet that is the Eucharistic sacrifice. And I do not think it would be too much to ask that the preparation that we make be up to the standard of that in which we are about to participate. Sometimes we who are priests are at times not the best examples. When there are large concelebrations, it is not uncommon to see the priests in the queue greeting their mates, whom they may not have seen for some time or catching up on the news. And we bishops, when we're on the concelebration line, at times are not exempt from this kind of behavior. As part of our tradition, respect and reverence are also demonstrated by gestures, such as genuflection before the Blessed Sacrament, whether simply passing in front of the tabernacle or during Mass when removing the saboria from the tabernacle and placing them back in. For this same reason, as the faithful receive communion, they are encouraged to make a sign of reverence, most easily by a simple bow, before receiving the Lord in the Eucharist. Once again, the Second Vatican Council encourages us in our respect for the liturgy. Servers, lectors, and commentators and members of the choir also exercise a genuine liturgical ministry. They ought, therefore, to discard, discharge their office with the sincere piety and decorum demanded by so exalted a ministry and rightly expected of them by God's people. Consequently, they must all be deeply penetrated with the spirit of the liturgy, each in his or her own measure, and they must be trained to perform their functions in a correct and orderly manner. A second point, to go back to rugby, while the game is played according to a basic set of rules that are to be respected by all, at the same time, there is room for creativity in the style of play which helps to make each game different, each game, well mostly, unless you're a fan of the Hurricanes, which helps to make, like me, helps to make each game exciting. In a similar fashion, while the liturgy is celebrated according to a basic set of rules, namely the rubrics, which are to be respected by all, at the same time, there is room for a certain amount of creativity in the sense of the many options that are available. The principles behind these are laid out in the Apostolic Constitution, which Pope Paul VI promulgated, the Roman Missal revised by the decree of the Second Vatican, the Second Vatican Council. And I'd just like to quote from that. Since the promulgation of the older Roman Missal, a liturgical renewal has developed and spread among the Christian people. According to Pius XII, this seemed to be a sign of God's providence in the present time, a saving action of the Holy Spirit in His Church. The renewal also showed clearly that the formulas of the Roman Missal had to be revised and enriched. This was begun by Pope Pius XII in the restoration of the Easter Vigil and the Holy Week services, which we have just celebrated, and before the 1950s, these were not celebrated as we know them now, and which formed the first stage in accommodating the Roman Missal to contemporary mentality. The Second Vatican Council laid down the basis for the general revision of the Roman Missal. Both texts and rites 
should be drawn up so that they express more clearly the holy things they signify. The right of the 